What's that? Hopefully it's the last time you'll screw up the name. Well, I don't have to say it anymore after this, so let's roll. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we start off with the buy-in Britt Baker versus B Priestley. And, yes. uh, you know, I, I, I have to eat a little bit of crow here. I, I admit that I've been a little bit down on the women's division in AEW. I felt like uh, they hadn't really been putting on good matches across the board. And this was uh, this overperformed, in my opinion. I thought this was actually a very worthy match to have to kick off the show. Um, Must not have had very high hopes for it, though. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. I actually no. thought it was going to be uh, pretty bad. And yes, yes, it was not a perfect match. And it certainly, yeah. certainly had some clunky spots in it. Um, a few, in fact. But I thought the intensity was there. I thought the storytelling was there. I thought the... Uh, the feeling that these two just did not like each other was there. The build to it was good. Uh, Britt Baker did that fantastic promo beforehand. Um, so, yeah, I actually thought this overperformed and ended up being the kind of match that should be on the pre-show, but then is a good pre-show match. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I, I Look, here's the thing. I, I didn't so much enjoy the match as I did the build to it. Right. And what I mean by that is, look, this they, they took it all the way back to this summer when Bea Priestley, you know, meaningful or not, basically Britt took a, a hard way heel to the back of the head that concussed her, and it led to this story over the last couple of weeks that we've seen through video packages where Britt Baker was calling her out and just like, look, I'm not going to pull any punches. She's a terrible wrestler. And then we had the answer from Bea Priestley last week on Dark. So all of this stuff was leading into something that, you know, the, the build to it, the story to it, was what I really enjoyed myself. So, yeah, while the match might have left some um, some things to be desired, uh, I'll leave it at that, it did show that there's potential for both of these ladies and, you know, as the highlights in the women's division. Uh, I'm not being too judgy on it just yet. Uh, frankly, I'm not being too judgy on AEW at all just yet. Uh, but more specifically, the women's division, I want to give it time to marinate and develop and do all the things it needs to do to become a real show. Yeah. And th other than this, I mean, they, they mostly killed it Yeah, for, I'd say for this entire show. But I, this is the one thing, and like you said, rightfully so, on the pre-show, mm -hmm. where it should have been. But I, I also wanted to call attention to the fact that they actually built a story fairly quickly with, with not a lot there, and it, it made sense for the... the animosity in the match yeah and i'd say it paid off with that animosity in the match you know from a technical standpoint definitely a couple of sloppier moments but uh, you know fine that 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 is what it is um i didn't mind it overall so yeah i thought it was a good pre-show match at the end of it we thought this was going to happen in the middle of one of the women's matches but it happened at the end after Britt wins and leaves we see uh, awesome kong and brandy come out and be a priestley's in the middle of the ring still recovering and they attack her, and Kong takes out a knife and cuts off a lock of Bia's hair and sticks it in her, in her, uh, her belt. What do you think's going on there? Not until I... after she smelled it, which was a little. Uh, uh... That's that's good stuff. Uh, yeah, that's that's fantastic. But, <laughs> but okay. So I had when they first did that Brandy video thing with uh, with Kong, and I called it a voodoo thing. You were like, "Where do you see voodoo?" And I'm like, I just, it was the candles and kind of the ritualistic stuff. Like, I thought I was seeing that. I thought maybe th there was some sort of supernatural element to it. Do you think, are you coming across to my side of this with this whole taking of the lock of hair? Or do you think that that's, there's something else going on there? I mean, if they had trotted a goat out and, okay, you know, come cut on. Its, and drank, you know, drank its blood. Or, I mean, wow. sure, I don't know. I mean, Brandy's still coming out in like a, a one piece singlet instead of like, uh, of, she doesn't have to come out lacy... like Papa Shango to, for it to be voodoo. Like this is a modern era, man. It can just be like have hints I, you on know, it. Doesn't it be a try a little nose? harder, maybe. Oh I, I don't God. know. She's she's coming out in you know in a wrestling singlet. It looks like a one piece bathing suit. Put a corset on and a big poofy ball, uh, whatever you call the dress things that make you look like an older era thing. I, I don't know. It doesn't dress the part. Okay, maybe you're you're too indoctrinated by WWE. It does not have to be that on the nose. You know what I mean? Like if she came out looking like Abby the Witch, uh, yeah, oh I'd, I'd be like, hell yeah, I'm all in on this voodoo thing. But I don't. She had a thing over her eyes, like she was going to a funeral or something. So I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's it's not there with me yet. I actually expected this to be an interference, as as you guys might recall uh, last week on the uh, Saturday's show. I was saying we might get an interference here, um, but it, they came out right afterwards, which I think was the right place to do it. 
They they did it here, and it was it was the right place to do it. But I'm glad they did. We at least have some confirmation that yeah. there's something going on here. Something to build. Um, more to develop, but uh, okay, you yeah. have my attention. And same. I'm like, okay, cool. That's what they're doing with that. Let's see where they go now. We need to have more things going on in the women's division. That's definitely one I'm curious to see where they're going from here. Yeah. Uh, on to the main show. Opening match. <sighs> Proud and powerful. Oh, God. I hate that name. Uh, Santana and Ortiz. You know, that uh, I think they were saying in our, in our Facebook discussion group, and this is, I think, nailed it on the head. There's nothing wrong with the name Proud and Powerful as a name for a tag team. Okay? That can work. It doesn't, however, conjure up the kind of imagery that you want to get from two guys who are kind of like street thug, uh, rough and ready, New York tough guys. That, rough and you know, ready would have been from, all, from, you know, from Puerto in, Rico. Infinitely better. Like, that's not... That's that's not the impression I get from the the, the name Proud and Powerful. I, th- I think that one of the first things I said when they said that was going to be the name is, yeah, that's the name of one of the acts we have down in our, our uh, uh, LGBTQ night at one of my bars. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. honestly like that's fair. You know, that's so that's that's the kind of imagery that comes up first for me. And I'm, apparently I'm not alone. A lot of people are getting that imagery. Um, that's not to say that they can't take this name and turn it into something for themselves. I'm just saying they're going to have an uphill battle with it. No, uh, it's, it's I, what it implies. Right. It's, it's, it's the, it's the, what you're, what you're putting out there as what you right. want people to think about. You know, I think of LAX and I think of like Westminster and Hawthorne. Sure. And, you know, it could get a little rough and rugged down there. And I just, you know, uh, so that's what I think of when I hear like LAX. It's the first you impression know, you think thing. About it. It's the first impression yeah. thing. And the first impression from that name is not what they're, I think, trying to go for with the tag team. Now, again, they can turn that around for people that know them, but still anyone who's going to be introduced to their team is going to hear that and be like, what? Uh, there's a bit of a disconnect there. And I, yeah. so I'm not a big fan of the name, but at the same time, like I said, let's see what they can do with it. Santana Ortiz are a hell of a team, and they ended up beating the Young Bucks here. As I think we, well, we, we called everything nearly correct on this card with one glaring exception that I'm really embarrassed about. But um, but we were right here. That, that Ortiz and Santana should have gone over the Bucks. They've got to establish that tag team division. They're coming. Uh, Bucks are coming in as the biggest stars of the division. They've got to create that parity in the division so that everyone feels like they could be on the same level, and then we can sort it out from there. Uh, same reason that they had to depower Kenny Omega after he came in. So having Ortiz and Santana go over clean here and look strong against the Bucks, I think was a good idea. And they even had the Bucks kind of come back at the end. Uh, Santana Ortiz were making fun of Rock and Roll Express, who were ringside throughout this entire match, and then afterwards they got involved when Ortiz and Santana and the and the inner circle were beating down the Young Bucks. Rock and Roll Express crawl their geriatric asses out to the ring and pull off some moves that they shouldn't be able to damn well do. No. Yeah, a, a Canadian destroyer and a tope through the ropes. It um, was a little bit of a slow motion Canadian destroyer, but I mean, still. Well, he barely got if, over. The I hope that when I'm road. that age, I could get out there and do a Canadian destroyer. You know, I don't know if fair I could, news. I don't know if I could do a Canadian destroyer now, and I'm still kind of on the dark side of the prime of my life. You know what I mean? Like, and this this dude's got 25 years on me, and he's doing one and, and going through the ropes like props, props to the Rock and Roll Express. <laughs> Um, I've actually seen some of their matches that they did recently, and uh, they usually look even better than this. When so, he took a suicide dive, he took a header out through the ropes. I was, uh, oh, let's just say I, I grimaced quite a bit, <laughs> wondering, oh, oh, God, no, don't, don't do that. I thought it was going to get a little bit out of hand um, when when they got in there. So I'm happy to see that everything worked out all right. I don't know where this is going to go, but... At the end of the day, it, it was a lot of good fun, and that's that's kind of what I, what I wanted to open the show there. Yeah, so, no, it was the yeah, right right one times. to have of all the matches on the card. It was this or the uh, tag team triple threat I thought should open the show, and I think having the Bucks pull the curtain was a smart idea. Yeah, it was. So, yep. uh, next up we had Hangman Page versus Pac. What were your thoughts on this match, brother? Uh, caught me off guard. Uh, I'll say that. Um, I thought it was stiff. AF, I thought they hit each other really hard, and I thought it was it was a fine match. It was really good. It feels like there's more to come, um, but I, I I'm not really sure where it's gonna go. I mean, once you I mean Pac, once you put him down like that, I think you and I had both 
called that Pocket needed the win here more than Page did. Well, that and, yes, but that's that was me not looking at the history of these two in the company and what okay. the story that they were trying to tell. And I actually am really kicking myself because initially this match was supposed to take place months ago, but because Pac had commitments with Dragon Gate and was the Dragon Gate champ, they couldn't have that match. And so now we've already had uh, a, a match with them on TV uh, where Pac won, or no, it was uh, earlier this summer where, where Pac won, so he got the first match win. And the fact that I didn't see that now that Pac isn't the Dragon Gate champ, he can lose. They want to have this be an ongoing feud. They're the number two and number three guy in the company. Of course they're going to have Hangman win here. This makes a ton yeah. of sense. I just was, I had a brain fart on the day. This makes all the sense to have Hangman tie it back up. And they've actually already announced there's going to be a rubber match on Wednesday. So Perfect. this looks like this is going to be an ongoing feud between these two. Or they're going, to, they're going to be having that hanging around the same level kind of thing going on. So... Um, yeah, really kicking myself for not calling this finish. They did put on a fantastic match, probably one of the better straight up technical matches on the show, balancing between the technical aspects and the excitement. Uh, I really liked this match a lot. Yeah. Uh, but the question now is who do you have? So, you know, here we said, well, Pac's got to go over now. The rubber match is Wednesday. What do you think is going to happen there? Because now they're tied up. They look like they're about on the same level. Good guy, bad guy, almost mirror images of each other in this company. The, the, honestly, the kind of uh, the, the way they've built both of these guys as as l being in each other's orbit a little bit and almost being at that same level. You know, one's a dark version of the other one. Th that's a very classic wrestling trope that doesn't get used enough. I yeah. think it's because just not enough people are the two people who are concentrated on the main events and not on that level right below that. And this is, this is that level right below that where you can have some of the best matches on the card, you know, your, your macho man and steamboats and have these two guys who have a very interesting dynamic between each other. And sometimes that can be more interesting than, than, than the top of your card. So I'm really excited sure. about what they do with these two. If they keep this something that, that roils up between them every so often. Um, but who, I guess what I'm saying, Nick is, who do you think gets that first win? That, that first kind of who who wins the first major victory in this feud? Well, this this screams. So what I want to preface what I'm about to say with is this screams what I've been thinking for the for the last month since Dynamite debuted, and it's that within the first 90 days they're going to need to introduce some kind of mid card title, and I'm not sure what that's going to be. But when I look at this match and I look at these two. It, this screams like an intercontinental title match to me, like these two fighting over a upper mid card title like the intercontinental or something along those lines. This kind of match and this kind of feud, exactly what you were just describing, that's kind of tailor made for wrestling, opposing each other, right? Yeah. That this screams to me that sort of intercontinental championship. Yes. Um, well, and, and that's what and I want. I want to have, have to jump in yeah. right there. I hate to jump okay. in, but they have been talking about adding another belt to AEW. Cody actually hinted at it last week. Okay. This would be and 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 honestly in our chat right now, uh Butters, I believe, just said something about like MGF coming in and screwing up the end of this rubber match. Um or some it doesn't even have to be MGF. Anybody coming in and, and screwing it up so there's no real resolution to it. And then you can start a build towards a secondary title where these two guys um you then have that second level where you can build up to that that all really falls into place very nicely. So sorry to interrupt, but that is actually a really salient point for, yeah. for what you're getting at. Yeah. Uh, and Andy just champ champ just said that Tony Khan said it's going to be announced this month. Well, there you go. So uh, there we go. Thank you very much, champ champ. I did not hear that. So uh, that's a, that's what that match screams to me, especially the outcome and especially the fact that we're going to continue the feud with the rubber match on Wednesday. That could be an awesome feud, long-term booking for a, an upper mid-card belt that we're apparently going to hear about sometime this month. I, yeah. I love the match. I can't wait to see the the, the rubber match on Wednesday. And they should have a mid-card title. Yeah, they've actually made point to say it's not a mid-card title. It is another title in the company. They don't want to mm, have, have okay. it to be like a lesser title or thought of in that way. It's just a different title obviously we be. know it's an upper mid card title we know it's yeah. a secondary title but at the same time it's not they don't it's want it 24 7 11 european championship that's what they don't want i think is a meaningless yeah, exactly title. 
That's what they're trying to avoid. But, as, <laughs> but I don't think you should take the main title off of Jericho for a good period of time. We've discussed no. this. So having another title that you can bounce around a little bit, I think, was a great idea. Uh, speaking of people that could get that mid-card title, quote-unquote mid-card title, Sean Spears. He had a match with Joey Janela, which I had mixed feelings about, and he ended up winning that using a spike pile driver off of the steps onto the outside with uh, Tully Blanchard assisting. Uh, looked nasty. And, uh, in fact, they had to have medical staff, quote-unquote, attending to Joey Janela after this match. Uh, uh, how do I put this? Nick, was this too WWE of a match besides, the obviously, the finish that you couldn't do in WWE? Like, did it feel a little um, bit... Uh, did it feel de- like a very deliberate Manufactured? Match? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. To, you know, starting at the end and working towards that outcome, yeah. You know, if, if the whole point of having this match was to have uh, Tully Blanchard do something to help, you know, hurt someone... Because uh, Sean Spears, what is he known for? He's known for the chair shot on Cody. Yeah, dirty. Uh, and being dirty. Yeah. So, again, here we go. Another another chance for to build up that. And that I'm okay with. Continuing to amp up the dirtiness and the evilness of Sean Spears. Right. I'm all in on I love that. I love his entrance. I love his MO. I love it. the chairman. I love all that stuff they've got going for him yeah. as as a character right now. And this just helped that. I'm, I'm, I want to talk about Joey Janela, though. Because Joey Janela has grown on me. Yes. Over the last month. Like well, I was never the biggest Joey Janela fan. A quick point before we get Go to ahead. Janela, and we definitely need to talk about him in this match, especially contextually with Sean Spears. But about Spears and the whole kind of WWE uh, booked way of this match where it just it seemed very much like a plotting, you know, A, B, C put together kind of match. Sure. Uh, and part of that has to do with Janela and how he relates to Sean Spears, and we'll get to that in a second, but as he was leaving, Spears made a point to say, I don't care what you think of my match style, I don't care what you think of my matches, I'm here to win, and that's what I did. And I like that in theory, that he's not out there to please the crowd, but there's only so far you can go with that before not pleasing the crowd makes it people not want to see your matches. So you exactly. have to, you got to walk that line a little bit. I like the, I like the, the theory behind that, like go out there, be a heel. You're not trying to please the crowd, leave it up to the face to do face moves uh, and get over. And that, and Janela did do that in this match, but that brings me to the point that I think you were getting at, which is Janela in this match. And the fact or Janela that, in general, in general, yeah. but especially in this match, Sean Spears is six, three, you know, uh, built like a, like an Adonis. It's easy. He's a, he's a, Prototypical WWE wrestler, tall, very in shape, good-looking guy. Janela is none of those things. He's no. he's gotten in better shape since he's come to AEW, but you know he's he is and and he's a not tall, flabby, scummy-looking guy. That is his gimmick. That's not a diss. That is his gimmick. However, when he's in a match against a guy like Sean Spears. Unfortunately, when Spears takes 14 minutes to put away Joey Janela, it makes Spears look like a goon in comparison, especially in a match like this. If it was a hardcore match and Janela keeps you like with Janela and Omega, you can see how Janela can stand up to Omega because he keeps using weapons and, and stuff to get over uh, yeah. or to beat Omega. But here, where they're just doing straight up technical wrestling, first, I like seeing Janela technically re- techn- do a technical wrestling because it's nice to see him be able to do that. And that was sure. impressive, but it's not believable against someone like Sean Spears. You kind of go, eh, you know what I mean? Like, at least with Riho and Nyla Rose, it's unbelievable, but then they do stuff to make you – it felt like a David and Goliath, right? This yeah. felt like David was hanging with Goliath a little bit too much, and it made Goliath look kind of goofy in comparison. Like, why isn't Spears putting this guy away? Uh it didn't make Janela look like he was resilient. It made Sean Spears look like he was weak, frankly. Um, and he, he also looks real. That's the other thing. When you say it's too much of a WWE kind of match, the, the one thing I will say about Janela is there's the you can identify with Janela. He's yes. not in the best physical he's not the biggest physical specimen. Smokes cigarettes after the match and outside the you know, just all that stuff, right? He's a real dude. But at the end yeah. of the day, it, like you said, if he's not in a hardcore match where he can, his bread and butter is taking big bumps. 
and well, doing stupid stuff. Let me put it this way. And let me put it this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, ex- no, you're here hitting the nail on the head, nail on the head. But I wanted, I wanted to catch that point as you were saying it. And that is, is that's his bread and butter, right? He's looking like one of us, acting like one of us, right? Yeah. So because of that, but because of that, like I look at a guy like Sean Spears, and you know, I don't, I, I've been in a couple of scraps in my life. We all have. But I genuinely feel like if I were to get into a scrap with Sean Spears, he could probably wipe the floor with me pretty quickly just because of cardio, cardio alone. All yeah. right. I could go for about five seconds and then I'm, I'm just I'm done. I got a couple I'm, I'm out of gas and there. I'm like, all right, yeah. dude, you win. I- <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll buy you a beer. Congratulations. The only way that I feel like I could hang with Sean Spears is if I called on my Scottish heritage and went a little dirty, started going low, poking the eye, doing a little kind of, you know, that kind of scratch and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh that's I think it's more it's not that you shouldn't have a match with Spears and Janela. It's you shouldn't have a technical wrestling match between the two of them. Fair. Janela Janela's should be out there. If he's doing uh, doing a match with Omega and it's a hardcore match, uh, then he can use that to his advantage. And it worked. When he had the regular match, Omega beat him pretty cleanly. I thought that was also well done. Here, having Janela hang for so long without having to get dirty, without using like the scratch, like we can, we're gonna identify with him because he's, you know, he's the baby face in this, and he looks like a normal guy. So we're gonna be like, yeah, you know, underdog baby face kind of thing. He's scrappy, but he's got to be scrappy believably, and we're gonna forgive him getting a little dirty if he's fighting for his survival in there. So sure. it was more to do with how this match was put together than the fact that it existed for me. Had I been booking it, I would have DQ'd him. I would totally give him the belt or something, and then they do the spike pile driver just as an aftermatch beat down or something like that. I think that would have bred the sympathy for Janela, but also done gotten the same effect of the evilness of possibly uh, of, sure. of, of Spears. And I, I feel like Janela got left looking like a little bit of a chump uh, out of this. We got the effect we wanted for Spears, but you, you did a little did a little dirty. It's interesting. For, uh, I, I thought Janela looked extremely strong after this because he hung with Spears for so long, and that actually made Spears look bad. So that was that was my perception of it. Um, but I also didn't believe that Joe Janela was that. I was like, it was un, he was unbelievably strong, if that makes sense. So that was that was I think more my issue. But yeah. either, either way, this match didn't read the way I think that the, it, it could have read or should have read. Sure. But it was, and again. It was a fine match. It was decently worked. It's just the believability was an issue, and I don't think that it needed to be. Um, and I, I'm, it's something that I know has been bandied about with some of the cast of characters in AEW, um, and I don't have the problem with someone like Marco Stunt going out there and working a match, but you have to make it so that it's it's believable if Janela or Stunt are in a match with someone who just visually reads as someone who's bigger and stronger than they are, just book it smartly so we believe that they are able to beat them either through their intelligence or through speed and technique or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it, there's yeah. a way to write that story that it's believable. So, yeah, that's all. Hey, want to want to give a quick shout-out to Abraham in the chat with the 10 bucks in the tip jar. Dude, thank you very much, thank sir. Thank you very much. Abraham. Thank you. Brother. Thank you. And uh, Michael Kirby, thanks for subbing. Welcome to the channel. Um... Where do we go from here? Uh, we've got the triple threat tag team match. Uh, SCU versus Lucha Brothers versus Private Party. Um, I, Short of what happened at the end of the show <laughs> that we can't talk about in the context of the show because it was a dark, lights out unsanctioned match, so it's not technically part of the show, but it was part of the show. Um, this was one of my favorite things of the night. Uh, really, I, I loved. I yeah, I loved this match. I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, this is the kind of tag team wrestling that you guys hear me talk about <laughs> and bitch about constantly when it comes to WWE. They've nailed it on the head. They've got an amazing tag division over it already in the first month in AEW, uh, and the Young Bucks were nowhere near this for right. the record. That I right. want to be. I want to make that perfectly clear. This was three tag teams that a lot of people had never heard of before. And, and they put on a badass match. And, and I, we I had, enjoyed the hell out of it. We had five tag teams on this show, Nick. And that's at least, I, by my count, three tag teams that they also have in their division that aren't on this show. And all three of those tag teams are money as well. Yep. That's a good tag division they've got going on there. Yes, they do. Um, that being said, I was a little underwhelmed by this. Yeah. And that, that's probably because I'm jaded and I expected so much more from these guys. 
I'm serious. Like uh, I, I based on based on what? Based on Pentagon and Phoenix in Lucha Underground, or based on SCU and, and PWG, or I mean, just what? And everywhere, like everywhere else, I've seen SCU and the Lucha Brothers either individually or as a tag team. Um, I I admit that I don't know Private Party as well as I I could or should, and they're certainly very exciting, and I think they have a big future in front of them, especially the way AEW is pushing them. But I feel yeah. I feel like it was a bit of a clunky start to this match, and it got there by the end. But I felt like it could have been better. And again, this is a, I mean, I expected, it, it, I, I fully admit, when I say I expected better, that's like me saying I expected five stars and I got four and a half. Okay, just yeah. to be clear. Right. Like, yeah. I was, I, my listen, ex, Meltzer. My expectations were too <laughs> Calm high. Calm down. <laughs> hey, if I was Meltzer, <laughs> right. I would say it was six stars, except it wasn't in the Tokyo Dome. Okay. Oh, so the, again, okay. so this, this was a really good match. My expectations were just so high based on who was in it. So I want to sure. make that clear that I wasn't, disapp- I wasn't, I didn't not like this match. I liked it a lot. I just I had such high hopes, and I I felt I was a little bit underwhelmed by it. Um, yeah. I also, <sighs> Nick, I, I I I it's something that I've seen a lot of where people are putting, um, what things that people get mad at in WWE, and then when they happen in AEW, and people forgive it, right? There's been a lot okay. of people discussing like, well, you got mad at that happening in WWE. Why aren't you mad at it in AEW? Um, something happened here that I felt was egregiously WWE and, okay. and not in a good way. Cause WWE does some things I think are great, but one of the things they did recently that I thought was absolutely awful and just stupid was they had Oscar lose to Carmella because another Oscar jumped on the side of the ring and Oscar got so distracted by this second Oscar that she got beaten by Carmella and then the other Oscar unmasked and it's James Ellsworth. Okay, (laughs) stupid. At the end of this match, after SCU picks up the win and retains their titles, another Pentagon Jr. gets in the ring, and Pentagon is so confused, he stands there dumbfounded as he's looking at another Pentagon, a very, a very, um, mm, how shall I put this, fallen-looking Pentagon Jr., and he stands there until he gets beat up by this other Pentagon. and Unmasked, and it turns out, of course, it's Christopher Daniels, back to get his vengeance, uh, for being taken out by Pentagon and Phoenix prior to the tag team tournament. Um, I hated this. I hated this. Oh, okay. I Hot take. It. Let's go. Yeah. What do you think? Um, again, if you like, I hated when they had the Ellsworth uh, distraction on Asuka. I thought this was, I thought this was dumb too. Like it's, it's cute. Okay. Chris Daniels shows up in a Pentagon outfit, but it makes Pentagon look like an absolute goon to be sitting there going, Dios mio, another Pentagon. What is he doing here? You know what I mean? Like, there, there's, there's ways that you can have people come in, dress as other people, that is wild and entertaining. This wasn't it. This didn't work if for you, me. If you want to know how to book Pentagon Jr., go watch season one of Lucha <laughs> Underground. Well, and that was actually by God. almost by accident, too. Because, But anyway, that's a whole other yeah, yeah. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for somewhere else. Um, I... That's one thing that I have no compunction about doing. If AE does, a- AEW does something stupid, um, whether or not it's WWE related, I'm not going to sit there and go, well, it's AEW, let's give them a chance. No, like it's, it was dumb. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a Christopher Daniels Pentagon feud if that's what they're going. Cool. Pentagon and Phoenix can absolutely be singles wrestlers, and at some point they should. A lot of their tag teams can go either way. Sure. I just This particular moment didn't work for me. That's basically it was the it was the do, the doubling and the unmasking and all that stuff that got you, not the fact that Christopher Daniels came out. I mean, if he had come out it yeah. was just as fallen angel Christopher Daniels with a chair and just beat the shit out of Pentagon, for giving him the 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 package pile driver on the ramp just as a get back, that would have been totally fine. And I think that's the way they should have done it. Frankly, this whole thing felt a little bit like or a stunt. even you I know, agree with a, you. a good one would have been if. You know something, something where he he literally trades places with with Pentagon, right? P- Phoenix goes for the tag, and some like if you're not sure, you don't, if you're not watching closely, you don't realize Pentagon's been taken out on the outside by another Pentagon. Phoenix goes for the tag, and Pentagon's there, and he kind of goes, "Wait, you don't look like Pentagon." And Phoenix gets confused, and the new Pentagon takes out Phoenix. Something like that. I know, obviously, his beef is with Pentagon Junior, but something like that where I don't know, it it feels more like an intelligent, dastardly move as opposed to <laughs> gotcha. And it's 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 belabored for so long that the person who's getting fooled looks like an idiot. 
And it's exactly yeah. what happened with the Oscar match. And we said we called it out then as saying that was really dumb. And I'm not going to say it was really dumb when WWE did it and not say it's really dumb when AEW does it. That's fair. Totally fair. There's so many better ways they could have pulled that off and executed a better version of the exact same outcome. Yeah. And yeah, it, it was I hate, fair, fair dues. Cool. Mo- hey. I popped. Don't get me I wrong. Popped. I popped hard. Oh, Chris you Daniels, know? he's back. And then I sat there and was like, that was dumb, though. You know? OK. Yeah. I- I'm also not going to compare Christopher Daniels to uh, James Ellsworth. But I digress. No, I no, <laughs> Nor should we ever. Right. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, Andy in the chat says it was mind games. And I, that's fine. Like, that's that is that is definitely an argument that is used a lot when they do things like this. We're like, oh, he's trying to get in his head. Um, but as, as, as you said, Nick, I think there was more exciting, better ways to do this to make Christopher Daniels look like a bit more of a mastermind and less like, you know, it's just it's it's just falling back on the mind games excuse, I think, is lazy. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I guess is what I'm saying. Agreed. Well, next up, we had the women's AEW Women's Championship title defense uh, with Riho defending against the teacher, Emi Sakura. Um, I I think we need to talk about this one a little bit because I feel like people didn't quite get this. And I, I'd love to hear your perspective on what the relationship between Riho and Emi Sakura means to you, especially as someone that follows Japanese wrestling as much as you do. Um, and how you think that that disconnect happened uh, where people didn't appreciate like the this match for what it was. I think part of it is they couldn't get their hands on enough old footage of them, maybe. I don't know. There was definitely a, a, a dropped ball here in terms of building for this, and I'm not sure why. And the other issue I had with it was the changing nature of Emi Sakura's character, where... On the one hand, she's trying to do a Freddie Mercury thing and get over the crowd by having kind of a rock star persona. And then on the other hand, she's, you know, evilly like beating up Riho and laughing at her pain and distress. And then at the end of the match, she goes back to saying, oh, no, I'm your teacher. You're my student. I'm so proud of you for finally surpassing the master. And I'm like, you guys are you got to lock this down. You got to lock this down. You have to tell us exactly what their relationship is and then have this match built to that story. Sure. And they didn't do either of those things. It became a heel face dynamic in the match where Emmy was acting dastardly uh, and Riho was having to fight upwards. And then it totally flipped after the match and Emmy Sakura's character went back and forth. Yeah. So I, I think that, and it was a, it was a very well worked match. You can tell these two have worked together a lot, and they have in the last of two minutes when the pace picked up. I think that's what the match should have been to really showcase Joshi style wrestling that w- would have made these two just go look insane. But we didn't yeah. get that for a good ten minutes until we got the last two or three minutes, and then uh, Riho just started crawling all over. Kudos to Emmy for being a solid base, but I mean, for Riho to just crawl all over the place. But she yeah. looks like Spider Woman, just all over. Um, Which is necessary when yeah. she's that size. Like yeah. we were saying earlier about believability. Like once you have Riho flipping all over the place and and you know tying Sakura up, and she it's almost like she can't follow her. Like that makes you go, okay, now I see how Riho is finally going to beat her. Um, and I don't I don't mind it building to that, but I, I definitely felt I agree with you that the curve of the match, if you will, like how it builds from the beginning to the end could have been less of a sine wave and more of a, a straight angle. Yeah, and it was just the, the the student and teacher angle didn't I don't think it got over. I don't think the message got across. I don't know that anybody was invested in that because like you said, we didn't see footage. We didn't see any backstage interviews or conversations between the two of them and all of that kind of stuff. But one thing I did notice, um and the you know, Japanese culture thing, even though Riho won, she still bowed lower than Emmy at the end of it. Yes. Very honorable thing to do. I love the ending of the match. I thought the 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 the, the race to the finish was fantastic. Uh, mm-hmm. I love that Rio retained here um, because I think she needed to. And yeah, uh, I, I love just the the kind of honorable ending of the whole thing was was all fantastic. The theater. Okay, so fantastic. imagine right, yes, and imagine this match if you had it billed as student versus teacher, and it was very honorable to start. And Rio saying, "Okay, I'm the champ, and I know that if I'm going to earn my place as champ." I have to defeat you, yes. my teacher and leader and master. 
uh, in this position. We've all watched and, enough right. anime and and samurai films at this point, right, to <laughs> to understand how some of this stuff works. <laughs> sure, or or whatever you know, yeah. pop culture phenomenon you want to you want to put it up against, but. Uh, you know, whatever framework you want to have for it, at the end, it's someone who's got to, it's like the final challenge is I have to defeat my master. I have to beat and, the master, the one that taught me. Sh- yeah. Sure. And you can have Sakura acting, you know, she doesn't have to be going full Pai Mei on this. She can actually do it in a way where she's saying, like, you may, have you not learned all your lessons? Um, and not be gleefully trying to hurt Riho, but definitely saying, like, you should be better than this. And Riho coming out on top at the end and Sakura then being like, all right, good job. I'm very proud of you. And that reads as a logical through line to this story, whereas what they told was very disjointed and very disconnected. And that's unfortunate because they had it even with the short build. They could have pulled it off. And just because I don't know whether through lack of communication or just not executing it properly, whatever it was, that story was not the one that was told. And it's unfortunate because it was just – it was right there. Yep. It was right there. Yep. They had it, and I think they – I think it was an assumption that people were along for the ride and knew what was going on. And I think that is why they just came saying, you know, student, teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher. Uh, okay. Well, and that's – well, yeah, but with the build, like, they were really pushing that. But then for some reason, Sakura wasn't playing into that in the match. Sure. You know what I mean? So yep. who didn't – who didn't convey to her, this is the build of the story we're telling. So when you're in this match – play it this way you know what i mean there there's that's what producers and agents are for is taking what the writers are doing talking to the wrestlers and saying how do we tell this story and then that it all comes out in the end right and the wrestlers yeah. go out there and they, they they paint their picture on the canvas sure so somewhere here there was that disconnect and of course we're never going to know probably where um i don't know if they'd ever admit that that's how it happened um but to me my perception of it was that somewhere along the line, someone should have been told, hey, tell this story. And they weren't told that, and they should have yeah. been. Yeah. No, this is the one we want to tell. Yeah. Um, let's see where Riho goes from here. It'll be interesting to see if the Britt Baker and Bea Priestley outcomes has any effect on this. Do we see uh, a Nyla Rose return You know, to face off with Riho next? I'm anxious to see where the Brandy and Awesome Kong thing goes as well. Um, there's a lot of stuff circling and marinating right now in the women's division and I'm not really sure what's next, and I kind of like that. I got to admit, I kind of yeah. like that. I don't know what's coming, so keep doing what you're doing, guys. Keep working on it. You know, it's you will find the spot. It's been a month, and some other elements they're bringing in, like Jamie Hader and Shauna. Like there's other things there they're bringing in. I, I'm very hopeful for their women's yeah. division. I don't. I'm not doom and gloom. I'm just no. saying right now, it's not where it could or should be. Yeah. Uh, but I think I think that they definitely have some a, a lot of potential. All right, so we are to the Main event, I'll do air quotes yes. to say main event, uh, Cody Rhodes uh, challenging Jericho for the AEW World Championship uh, in what has been most of the build for at least the last couple of weeks, if not the entirety of the month since they've debuted, uh, yeah. leading us to the culmination of Cody versus Jericho here at Full Gear. Um, Talk about a big fight feel for this match. Oh, it did. Oh, it did. Right? And we had uh, we had several people in attendance. Thank you to uh, former BWO Pickham's champion, Justice Dutterer, for Justice. sharing footage and pictures yeah, with us brother. throughout the night. Thank you very much for that. Um, Ian, I want to let you go first here because I have some things I want to say about uh, about the end because we're okay. definitely going to be talking about the end. <laughs> I'll talk about the end. Um, but, yeah, why don't you break the match down for us and um, we'll talk about what happened at the end. Well, so first of all, I think part of the way that they got that big fight feel was to treat it like, uh, like, like a legit match. You know, you got the three judges ringside, and if it goes to the 60 minutes, and they're the ones who are going to determine who won based on a point system. Of course, all you know, all a work, but still great. Also, damn, they got some good judges, man. You had uh, Arn Anderson, Dean Malenko, and the great Muda. Uh, I mean, that's some judges right there. Damn, that's great. I mean, and also. Can I just say before I get into this match, the one moment where Jericho has a face off with Malenko gave oh. me the goosies yeah. on every square just... inch of my body because I went back. Dude, the the very first memory I have of Chris Jericho, the very first memory, and I may have seen him before this, but this is the first the first time that I went that guy was him doing the list of the thousand and five moves or whatever, right? Right. 
Dean Malenko, thousand, the man of a thousand moves. And Chris Jericho's like, I'm the man of a thousand and five moves. Here, let me bring out my printout of all the moves I know. Right? From that my fantastic- dot matrix printer, Oki Data Dot printer. matrix printer. <laughs> and then he brings out a sheaf of paper, grabs the top one, and goes, boom. And the rest of it just tumbles across yeah. through this huge, long Santa Claus list. And it's that brilliant segment back in WCW where he starts reading off the top one. He's like, arm bar, reverse arm bar, arm drag. And it goes to commercial, right? Um, and it, when it comes back, the crowd is screaming and yelling at him. And he's still going. He's like, move number 48, reverse uh, Willie Nelson McGuffin or whatever the heck it was. Like, <laughs> he had some, some hilarious move that was like an inside joke. He was still going. And, you know, you find out later that they went to, the brilliance of Chris Jericho, when they went to commercial, he stopped reading and started insulting all the local sports teams. And that's why the crowd was so hot. Love it. And as soon as they, they're like, hey, we're Chris, we're coming back from commercial. And he goes, yeah, and also the Oilers suck. Number 238, right? So the crowd's hot. Brilliant wrestling mind even then. That's, he was in a feud with Dean Malenko then, and that is the first time I remember seeing Chris Jericho and going, who is that guy? It's the original list of Jericho. <laughs> yeah, the original list of Jericho. Back when, like, Ralphus, he kept coming out with Ralphus. Remember Ralphus? Yep. So to see him and Malenko have a stare down after all these years, that was such a moment in this match for me. And it wasn't even part of this match, which was also a fantastic match. They started it off really slow. I thought that was their way of hinting they might go 60. And I thought that it was smart of them to have the uh, the judges there to try and hint that they might go 60 so that the whole crowd was ready for it to be a long match. You were ready to, to dig in and watch a nice long match. It was about 42, and, 45 minutes, if I remember. Yeah. yeah, it, yeah it, was, is, it was good and long. Which is long for a Western match. Yeah. You know? And so I think that psychologically, them preparing the crowd for a long match with the judges and with the slow pace at the start and the 60-minute time limit, that was all smart. That was that was well built, good booking, smart setup. Um, and the drama started really early in the early in the match where Cody went for a dive and Hardway busted himself open on the barricade. Whew. Just just opened himself up, huge cut, took like 18 stitches after the whole thing was done to close him up. Just like a, a like you'd whole his whole right side of his face kind of fell a little bit because like it was so deep. A little flap Ugh. of skin up there. Ugh. It was gnarly. It was gnarly looking. Um, had a huge. I mean, Cody by the end of this match looked like hell. There was part of me he that, that like wondered hell. if they had uh, if they had gimmicked it, if it was a gig or something like that. Where, nope. you know, but when I saw that it was like round, I was like, that was jagged. That's a that's, deep and round. That's busted op- busted yep. wide open. Busted literally. wide open. <laughs> that we we had a true busted wide open. Hard way came down weird. Um, you know, he had a huge contusion on his ribs. He was selling for most of the match. There was a great moment where his his mom was ringside and Jericho got in her face and her husband's face. And uh, I think it was her husband, uh, her new husband. And um, she screamed F you at Jericho. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was just, yeah, it was a great, it was a well-worked match. And uh, at the end, it was, a, a I thought, a very strong finish where yeah. Cody was still hanging in there and fighting with all of his might. And Jericho just kept putting him in the walls of Jericho. He just had an answer for everything Cody had, and finally Cody got put in not just the walls of Jericho, but the Lion Tamer, which is even gnarlier looking than the walls. And um, and then MJF threw in the towel. MJF screaming at Cody, who's like passing out in this Lion Tamer. He's got nothing left, and MJF throws in the towel. Well, when I, and I saw retains. him over to the side uh, with a towel, previously with yeah. a towel, I went, uh oh. My, my mind started racing, <laughs> going. Oh, I get it now. Oh, it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, if you haven't watched AEW Full Gear by now, shame on you. It's been 72 hours at least. Well, it's 50 bucks. It's not like That's it's true. Cheap. That's true. So, if you're listening to us to get the breakdown because you didn't watch f- Fine Fair Dues, um, MJF throws in the towel. And yeah. this is uh, the one other thing I wanted to address really quick is Aubrey's referee's discretion of letting Jericho. Uh, whip Cody with the belt. And I'm wondering where that line is between DQ and not. And is it okay to take a weightlifting belt off and that is just, you know, a good quarter to half inch thick of leather and just start whipping somebody with it? Even if it's plastic, it's that's still going to hurt. 
<laughs> well, that's Cody. Cody did that with his weight belt too. I mean, I understand, you know, the, but are we? We're setting dues. we're setting precedents here by allowing Aubrey to make the call to not DQ the match there. And I think we all need to remember that because it's going to come back. They're doing that intentionally so that they can do something like that and I loved, later. Uh, yeah, and I love the fact that Aubrey was – like Jericho and she got into it a couple of times. Yeah. And I, that's, that's becoming an ongoing thing is Jericho getting her face and her shoving him back, you know, where she's the one ref that will stand up to him. Yep. So I love what they're doing with that little sort of sub-story. Um, but the main story here is after the match, Cody is, <laughs> as you can imagine, dejected. And uh, MJF is pleading and begging and crying. I'm so sorry, Cody. I had to do it. You were suffering. I had to do it. And Cody starts to forgive him. And right as he forgives him and stands up, MJF kicks Cody in the nuts and drops him to the ground. And MJF turns heel. Rochambeau. Full on. <laughs> oh, no. And he walks out to a chorus of booze, the crowd chanting asshole. One fan throws a full on drink on him. Security and, got uh, on that guy real quick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Unless it was a work. Not saying. Just saying. But, uh, yeah, MJF, is the heel turn too soon? Or is this the right time to turn him heel? Uh, I feel like they've been hinting at it for a couple of weeks, and I think it was time. Uh, either shit or get off the pot, as my, my grandpa used to say. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where they've been teasing. They tease it with the, uh, the chair when he ran in with the chair, and the inner circle had, had him held, and he had to make a decision. And you could see the hesitation, and I think that was a tease to what we ultimately had happen uh, in this after this match at full gear. So uh, it, I'm more interested in where we go from here, not how we got here. It was kind of predictable. You kind of saw it coming. Um, but at the same time, I have no idea where it's going. I mean, obviously there's going to be some kind of feud now with MJF and Cody. Um, does MJF just get beaten down by the rest of the elite? Um, I, I'll be anxious to see what goes on from here. So I, yeah, I don't know is what MJ, you MJF a rogue agent? Is he inner circle? Like what? Where is he going yeah. with this? He was saying after the match, my turn now, my turn. So uh, yeah, obviously this was a, this was one thing I thought they were going to hold on to for longer, and I understand why they did it here because they have to have Cody pivot. Like this is a this is a major moment for Cody's character. He can never challenge for the title again. What does he do now? Is he an executive? Where does he fit in AEW structure? Um, so it makes sense for him now to have a new nemesis kind of rolling around there, perhaps not a member of the inner, inner circle, but another, uh, player rolling around in the, in the AEW stratosphere yeah. that he could possibly bump into and have some issues with. So I, I understand why they did it here. I would have liked to have seen it just be this really long drawn out heel turn where you keep expecting him to turn, keep expecting him to turn. But I suppose if you really look at it, they have held off to, on it, on it for about a year. So fair dues. I'm looking, I'm very not, that's, that to me is come back next Wednesday and see what happens kind of storytelling. My God. Like, I, <laughs> I got to see what happens next. I'm, I'll be there Wednesday. What's um, up with MJF? Explain that. Now we can go full heel too. He's not going to be coming out and saving Co Cody's ass. We can have full heel MJF. And that's a reason to tune in on Wednesdays just in and of itself. I almost wish we didn't have the next match, even though it's very hard for me to say, because you know, my, uh, rabid affection for, for hardcore style wrestling, ECW, CZW stuff, um, because I absolutely loved it. But can you imagine going dark and and ending the pay-per-view with the shot of MJF close up and beer having a beer thrown at him and after what had just happened and that ended the show? Oh, my God! Just yeah, make sure you turn no in way. Wednesday! Oh. There was no way they were following this next match, but that would have been a solid closer. Uh, I think it's it sticks in the mind regardless, but there's no way they could have followed this next match no. because sure enough, the next and final match that we had, and it was in the right place. I know it came after the title match, Nick, and I know that's something that, that you would have driven you nuts had they not explained it so well, right? Again, if you explain something in logical ways, you know, We'll we'll swallow a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's just don't do it just because. Give us a reason. Sure. Why was this match on last? Because it's unsanctioned. We have to turn the lights off, and it's not it's it's not an AEW sanctioned match. We're still going to allow it to happen, but it's not an AEW. It's not part of the AEW show. The AEW show ends at the title match, as AEW shows should. And if you want to stick around for this next match, you can or you can leave. Because this might not be a match for the faint of heart. Yeah. And it wasn't. 
Because if you had told me that in 2019, a major Western, uh, one of the two major Western companies in wrestling, pro wrestling, would put on a traditional death match, I would have laughed you out of the building. And this was about as traditional a death match as you're going to get. In in a major Western company, like well, obviously we've had ones, as you said, CZW, Lucha Underground had some of the goriest matches I've seen on TV in years. Um, it's immediately I, you know, what I some... thought of when they brought out the bag of shattered glass. I immediately thought of the the three stages hell of hell of match, hell of war match. Sorry, not three yeah. stages of hell, hell of war match. Um, but yeah, I, I, I saw. <laughs> Not say, I mean, I, saw, I used to go to XPW matches here in L.A., and those things were just disgusting spectacles of, of gore and torture. The only thing but, missing from this match was bundles of light tubes. Um, that was shout out to that CDW. Was actually, <laughs> that was what I was going to say, Nick, is I think people that thought this match went too far or was there was too much or it was too gory, I actually I, I was sitting there watching it as a dude who has consumed a lot of death matches in his time yeah. and actually really enjoys them when they're done properly. Um Let's just say I introduced I, people to a medley of CZW matches uh, right. that were in the chat in in uh, for watching Full Gear live with us, and uh, yeah, this t- in perspective, in comparison, this this is this was a night a bedtime story. <laughs> Four out of ten. Yeah, uh, on the on the on the horror scale of death matches. Yeah. Um, you know, nothing was on fire. There was no real glass. It was all you know. It was all basically broken uh, safety glass. Yeah which is why they weren't getting totally shredded. They were just getting, like, lightly nicked. Um, but for a major wrestling company, this is about as close as you get to a proper death match. You had a barbed wire mesh at one point that they did a suplex onto that looked truly gnarly. You had the, the barbed wire baseball bat, the barbed wire uh, broom being used to sweep Kenny's back, which was a oh. gnarly visual. As you said, the broken the pile of broken he glass. He the one, barbed wire bat across. Uh, I almost said Dean Ambrose across John Moxley's forehead, and just he sure. started blessed, bleeding out, stabbing him, stabbing him in the forehead with an ice pick. At one point, he had uh, Moxley in a sharpshooter on the broken the pile of broken glass, and Moxley had to crawl across broken glass to get to the ropes, which I thought was a that was a great, like obviously you know he he it, it sounds worse than it actually was because it was. Safety glass. Yeah. But he crawled through broken glass to get to the ropes. That's a goddamn call. Yeah. That's a, what an amazing. He'll do anything to get out of this hole. You know, just, yes. Right. Meanwhile, you've you got also... Renee Young, John Moxley's <laughs> wife, live <laughs> tweeting the Twitter. entire thing. <sighs> so I had another window open off to the side with just her tweets yep. going. Uh, she goes, yes and yes. No, I don't like this. <laughs> yes. Just stuff like that. I... That was almost as entertaining as the match. Only it was yeah. her just cringing wherever she was, like, "Oh God, no!" <laughs> uh, there was not quite as effective was the giant board covered in mouse traps, which was a little bit uh, goony. But who set whatever. all those? By the way, I mean, props for setting <laughs> all those. You know, <laughs> someone got some snap fingers. You know they did. Yeah. Um. But, <laughs> but here's the thing: we knew the second Moxley left WWE, he was looking for an opportunity to one of his favorite wrestlers. And also, a, a guy I really respect uh, is that Sushi Onita. And if you don't know that name, Google him. I'll put some stuff up in the, in the group about him. One of the greatest deathmatch wrestlers, wrestlers of all time. True Japanese legend. Arguably one of the coolest entrances ever. Um, and a guy who, if you don't know him, Moxley has absolutely based a ton of his persona and character on. Uh, big time. Like, might owe him some money kind of thing. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and uh, there was a, you know, I know that ever since he left WWE, he was like, he was sitting there just dying to do another damn death match. And he got it. And you could tell from the glee with which he jumped into this match, how much he's just like, yes, I finally get to do it. And they're, they're giving him an opportunity to do it. Um, make no bones about it. This is not the last one of these that we will see good in a W good with the cast of characters. That they have there: Jimmy havoc, Darby Allen, Joey Janela. We're going to have more of these. This was an introductory match and it did not go anywhere near as hardcore as some of the stuff that we will see in the future. In addition, pl- trust me, once, once Jimmy havoc starts cutting, giving people paper cuts between their fingers and pouring lemon juice on it and stapling it, his own tongue, You'll see some shit. This freaked out a lot of people. 
And it's good because they're gently letting people into that other world that they have a lot of guys from. In addition, this was also a really smart match psychologically. Yeah. Like this was a well this was a well worked match on top of being a spot fest and a horror show. So, and that's honestly the real thing with the death match is yes, it's a spot fest. It's not about technical wrestling. It's about big moments that make the audience cringe and go, ooh. Who but can they make can't the other one give up first, right? That's really sure. what it's about. Like, Breaking down what, your opponent psychologically. What, what weapon do I have to go get that's going to make you uh, give sure. up, right? And then ultimately beating them into submission, Moxley pulling back the, the, the ring padding, and they give each other gnarly shots on the pine. Uh, you know, include, oh my God, uh, what freaking, uh, Omega did a, uh, uh, a splash, 450 splash onto the pine. And that one of anything in this match that made me cringe the most. I was like, okay. Oh God, ow, ow, ow. Uh, well, I mean, the but, Yorkshire Rob called out the, uh, the weed eater in chat and I'm like, yes, yes, that's yes. until you, until the weed eater comes out, this is still very PG 13. So, <laughs> I, well, that's, and that's the other thing I want to point out is at no point in this match did they injure each other enough, yeah, so that either of them was bleeding at the end of the match. All of the wounds they sustained were such minor lacerations that their own sweat cauterized and wiped away all the blood by the end of the match. That's not a really hardcore death match. No. Usually, you see, you, like I've seen these matches most of the time end with full-on crimson masks. And just gore all over the place. This one was fairly tame. And that's what I want to point out is this was an introduction to this style for a lot of people that don't normally see it on this kind of scale or on this kind of uh, platform. And in addition, it also had an undercurrent of actual wrestling psychology. Uh, so in that sense, I really enjoyed this match. I thought it was a fantastic example of the style. And it was smart to have Kenny do this. If Kenny, Kenny on one hand, is a guy who wants to say, I'm the best wrestler in the world because I can wrestle any style and do it well. And he just proved he can do a deathmatch style, right? He's done comedy yep. exceedingly well. He's done an hour-long technical master class. Uh, he's done, you know, five-minute, you know, go full speed. He's wrestled a goddamn blow-up doll, all right? He's done it all. He can he, do it all. Didn't he wrestle an eight-year-old girl, too, or 12-year-old girl wrestled, or something like that? Uh, that I, yes, it wasn't Riho. That was someone else. Was it Riho? I don't, it might I don't know. I, I don't I'm, I'm spacing. But he, he wrestled an eight-year-old girl. Yeah. Um, and in addition, he uh, you know, now he's done this. Moxley, on the other hand, has been saying for years that he loves this kind of match. Now he gets a chance to show off just what he can do in it. So everyone wins here. So, yeah, all around. I, and I, there was a lot of flack this match caught. Afterwards, people who thought it was too blood and guts for a major company, people who thought it was just a spot fest. And to that, I say, yes, it is just a spot fest. That is the style of wrestling match that is the same way that you have a, a wrestling comedy match. If you have Orange Cassidy and out there doing comedy and Joey Ryan dick flipping people, that's a style. It shouldn't be every match. You, the match right before this was a old school wrestling technical storytelling match. You know what I mean? Like you had a tag team clinic earlier in the show. You had your buffet of all the different kinds of matches. This was just one of those styles. Yeah. It just happened to be a very high profile one. The last thing I'll throw in here is that uh, when this came on, I knew what was coming. They did a good job preparing me for what I was about to watch. And I was sitting there eating my popcorn with eyes wide open with a hip, oh, yeah. huge evil grin on my face going, yes, bring <laughs> it on. What turns my stomach worse is when, you know, Dustin hits the wrong vein when he blades at double or nothing and gets crimson masked or when Cody takes a header through the ropes onto a, a diamond plate ramp and busts himself open. Uh, that stuff's like, oh, God, that I don't see it coming. Like, that's the that's the stuff that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. But, yeah, this was this was so my speed. If If I could watch a four-hour pay-per-view of nothing but this, and I guess I could just go back and watch some old ECW or CZW. I could go watch Sandman bust himself open with some beer cans if I wanted to. But yeah. this, uh, I hope that this shows that there is an appetite for this style of exhibition out there. Um, yeah. Like there has always been. There will that always crowd was be into it. all of those of us, in the, myself included, that are into this kind of stuff. And, you know, 
I, I, I loved Jackass because I loved watching people hurt themselves. And be stupid. <laughs> this is kind of exactly that. It's a little know? bit, it's a little on the Jackass yeah. fringe, sure. Yeah. But uh, the other thing, and this is something that we say about, uh, we've said in the last couple of weeks, but overall as well, about main of main uh, roster WWE is, yes, we have like, let's say like whatever it was a week ago on SmackDown, like Corbin and Roman in a three on three tag match on SmackDown, right? And we're, you know, <laughs> You and I, who watch every episode, and a lot of people that listen to the show, we're also just sitting there going, oh, my God, not this again. Um, but at the same time, the live crowd was frothing for that match. And if I see a live crowd frothing for a match, I say, well, who am I sitting on my couch to judge how good this match is when obviously it's doing what is intended, which is entertaining the live crowd. So anyone who looks at this match and says uh, this shouldn't have been on the show – that live crowd was eating this up. So consider that as well. And that you're there to please the crowd, and this did just that. Yep, absolutely. Well, guys, that was AEW Fuel, a Full Gear. That's the last well, time I got to let's, let's Let's put a cap on this. Let's, oh, okay. Let's put a cap on this. Okay. We, we, first of all, as we said, we got every pick right. We, we both picked exactly the same thing, except the hangman except pop hangman, match, yeah. which I'm kicking myself on. I will forever. What do you think overall about the pay per view? Just one, one quick, like quick question here. Actually, two. One point five. Um, is AEW doing what it should be doing? Was this a good pay per view? Is this the kind of build they should have for their pay per view? And, uh, and this is calling back to Abraham Castillo in the in the chat, who said, you know, he's like, I, I'm not going to drop fifty bucks on this. Was this worth fifty bucks, or is fifty bucks too much to charge for a pay per view like this in the post network era? Um. I want to temper this with a couple of different things. I'm glad you brought this up before we transition because I did mean to bring this up and talk about this. I've I've said here on the show that when when Double or Nothing was was coming, I had to sit there for about 10 minutes and convince myself to spend the the 50 bucks to watch it. And I thought I want AEW to be successful, so I'm going to support these efforts. But this can't be long term. Like, you can't have five to six pay-per-views a year at 50 bucks a piece anymore. And if you guys remember what I've been saying this whole year that we've been building AEW, they've got to get the streaming thing right. I've been saying it since last fall when we first started hearing grumblings about this. They've got to get the streaming thing down, whether it's a $10, $15 a month thing through Fight TV or Bleacher Report or something, they've got to get that right. And there's what, so much infrastructure you have to have for I, that. Though. I understand, but it's already built in and you can just do a royalty to whoever's hosting your content. They've already got great relationships with fight TV and bleacher report live. I'm enjoying the bleacher report platform. I had, I didn't know they Same. had a live platform until AEW came around, but I've been cruising around watching some soccer, watching uh, some old boxing matches and stuff like that. I'm having a blast. So can they get away with $50 per pay-per-view? No. Um, are they going to do something where they only charge for a couple of them getting... a year and we get the other couple free like they did this year? I don't know to be determined. Tony Khan, AEW, let us know what the plan is because that's going to drive a lot of attendance and viewership into, you know, if, if you're going to charge me $50 for the next one, let me know that the next two are going to be free. Communication. Um, sure. One way or another. But... I don't know that there is an appetite out there for $50 per pay-per-view anymore. And that's a really quick way to watch your pay-per-view buys decline rapidly uh, if that continues lo over a long term. Yeah, and and we're actually having some really great discussion about this in the chat. Also, one thing I do want to say is uh, Champ Champ did correct me. Oh. Um, the, girl, the girl that Omega faced, was her name was Haruka. She was nine. It was ah. not Riho. That is an urban legend. Thank you, Champ. For, for Always being on my the ball. Google. Thank you. Um, also, yeah, a lot of people are saying in our chat right now uh, that that's just a little that's, that's a little much. Like in this day and age, 50 bucks for a pay-per-view is a little high. Um, we even have, uh, yeah, uh, Champ again here with, the, with saying a lot of under-18s in Japan gave up on pro wrestling because it's so expensive to have an, have an education and try to pay for these pay-per-views. Um, our uh, ex-Champ Justice says he paid less to actually go to the event live. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Um, so that's that and that's and that's the thing. Watching this show, I I dropped 50 bucks on this. I did. I, it and honestly, it stung. It stung a bit to drop 50 bucks on this. Yeah. Um 
I, it hurt. I, I don't want it to be derogatory towards the show because this is what I've come to expect over 30 years of pay-per-view buys and things like that. But yeah, WWE has set the bar, guys. Love mm-hmm. it or, or hate it, they've set the bar. And you, you, whether they start introducing tiers between $10 and $20 for different things, you've got to have a monthly subscription streaming option that includes all your pay-per-views, period, yep. hard stop. I don't care if it's 20 bucks a month or 5 bucks a month. One of the two, you, you got to have something for us. Yeah, I don't have the, the info on the buys in front of me. Maybe that'll be in the news segment on Saturday, how their pay-per-view numbers did. But I'm very curious to know because that is going back to an older model of doing shows. And I don't know if that model is still applicable in the modern era of the WWE network. Yeah. And I, I, I'll be honest with you. If I wasn't doing the show that, that 50 bucks, I want to throw a thank you right now out to our patrons because that came from our patron subscriptions. I would not have paid 50 bucks for this show. I would have gotten my, I, I watching highlights on YouTube, Simon Miller ups and downs on AEW. You know what I mean? Shout out to Simon Miller, uh, current H champion. Yes. Um, I, 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 I would have had a hard time dropping 50 bones on this show if I weren't being subsidized by the, the patrons for this show to yeah. do this show. And that's where the money came from to, to watch that. So thank you to our patrons. Thank you, guys. Because you, you allowed me to give you this content for the show to watch this, this, this show. Yeah. Um, and so I very much empathize with a lot of people that are out there going, man, I'm dropping 50 bucks on AEW. That's something that AEW's got to look at. I ultimately came down on the side. I, I, I was debating this. I was talking to my lady about it, and I was like, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's just, yeah. And I, I, I went for a walk, and I came back, and I'm like, you know, you know what? I want them to be successful. I'm sure. I have 50 bucks to give them. I want them to be right. successful. I want to see them do well, and that's ultimately where I landed. So regardless but you of, have that 50 bucks. I do. I do. Yeah. So. You know what I mean? Like in my budget, saying fifty bucks for a pay per view is that's that's over that's over in my frivolous expenses column. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah, if I, I if I weren't getting subsidized. So anyway, yeah. So interesting stuff. Um, I'm looking forward to more AEW this week. Uh, definitely an ongoing debate about how they're going to manage their pay per view system. But. 